Um, so I'll start now. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ambassador T. P. Srinivasan, for uh, agreeing to give this online uh, distinguished lecture at our department. Um, I would I would be moderating this whole uh, event, and uh, uh, we have, of course, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, and also Head in Charge. Uh, uh, Dr. Nand Kishore, uh, and, and uh, we have students of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, as well as as other as well as units of the of Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Uh, so, without much ado, I would like to first uh, invite uh, Dr. Nand Kishore uh, to give the welcome remarks. Sir, over to you. Uh, good evening, all of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Ambassador T. P. Srinivasan with us, and uh, I have heard him um, for quite some time now. And I had the opportunity to even interact with his son uh, in New York, in the University of Columbia, where he is a faculty. And that's when I actually got to know uh, regarding Ambassador T. P. Srinivasan. And then subsequently, since 2013, uh, I have been uh, meeting him in one of the other forum in Kerala in many of the institutions of uh, eminence um, that are there. And he's been delivering lectures. He's been one prominent personality. Uh, you would regularly see him in, on televisions on, on issues of uh, India's foreign policy and many other aspects. He also exclusively conducts a program uh, on, uh, on India's foreign policy. He, he gets uh, scholars from uh, different parts of the country and then discusses with them. So uh, we, without uh, wasting much time, I would want to introduce him to the audience. Uh, T.P. Srinivasan Ambassador. T.P. Srinivasan is a former ambassador of India with 37 years of um, service in the Indian Foreign Service. He was the ambassador of India to the UN and the governor uh, for India of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Vienna, the deputy chief of mission of the Embassy of India, Washington, ambassador and deputy permanent representative of the India to the UN, uh, New York, uh, the high commissioner of India to Kenya and also the high commissioner to Fiji. He has also served in New York, Yangon, Moscow, Thimpu, Tokyo and New Delhi. After retirement, he was the executive vice chairman of the Kerala State Higher Education Council and a member of the National Security Advisory Council too. Presently, he is the chairman of the Academic Council and director of the NSS Academy of Civil Services and the director general of the Kerala International Center. He has authored uh, seven books and he has been regularly contributing uh, to a lot of newspapers and other things, which he himself said a few minutes ago. He contributes to STS for which uh, all of us are involved in the Department of Geopolitics. Apart from that, then he has been regularly writing columns uh, uh, in the vernacular language. Now he's also writing for the Sunday Guardian uh, of late. And he, he says that the, the Miss Danshri or Dr. Danshri was instrumental in all these things. And he has also written in a lot of foreign journals too. So uh, it's a great, uh, great pleasure to have you uh, with us, sir. And uh, we look forward to your, uh, what do you say, uh, enriching lecture. And with this, I welcome you. And then uh, uh, please, uh, I hand it over to Dr. Danishri Jaina. Thank you, sir. So with that words, I would also like to welcome everyone. So I now see also there are uh, external participants from outside the university as well who are participating in this webinar. Uh, this special lecture uh, on Indian foreign policy in the COVID-19 era. Um, so now it, I would like to welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Venkatesh uh, to uh, give the presidential remarks, sir. Thank you, Dr. Dhanashri, and uh, thank you, Professor Nand Kishore. I'm uh, extremely pleased to be part of this um, uh, distinguished lecture to be delivered by uh, esteemed Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan. And there are two on a contemporary matter of Indian foreign policy in the COVID-19 era. Ever since the COVID pandemic hit us and hit the entire world badly since the early part of this year, the world has been grappling with various issues, healthcare, diplomacy, you know, the uh, pharmaceutical supplies, vaccine development, and also certain conflicts which are happening in different parts of the world, especially the one which uh, India and China had in our northern boundaries in JNK. COVID-19 pandemic has uh, created a difficult and complex scenario for international relations. Uh, one of the 
Most immediate effects of the pandemic has been the travel restrictions imposed between states to stem the global spread of the disease. The latest in this uh, in this aspect has been literally the travel isolation of UK with travel bans across the world, Europe and the rest of the world following it with the new strain of uh, coronavirus, which is supposed to be extremely fast spreading and though not necessarily more virulent, but this has led to a kind of a panic situation across the world. This has significantly affected the economic, diplomatic and even the political relationships between states. The lockdowns introduced by states across the world in response to the pandemic have led to an upset of global trade and commerce. At the same time, the pandemic has also fanned certain amount of antagonism between states and some of them have been magnified, leading to tensions and even situations leading to conflicts. The global community has been searching for ways and means to forge alternate pathways for conducting their normal diplomatic relations, including virtual, bilateral and multilateral meetings. India, like other states, has been facing similar problems in its external affairs. India has been mindful of the global trends underway during the pandemic era and has adopted significant measures to cope up with the crisis. Perhaps the most prominent among them has been its efforts at strengthening the domestic and economic base at a time of great disruption of its external environment. The vision of Atmanirbhar Bharat has been well-timed, well-conceptualized. In such a time of crisis, India's tough neighborhood has also created serious challenges to its sovereignty and national security. Consequently, we have been arming, India has been arming itself at a rapid pace and has been bolstering its partnership with like-minded countries across Indo-Pacific. It has also been utilizing its innate strengths in biotechnology to provide much needed respite from the pandemic to its smaller neighbors as well as to the global community. With the emergence of the new vaccines against COVID-19, India attempts to emerge as one of the world's leading supplier of vaccine. And this certainly holds a great diplomatic opportunity as India happens at the current moment, the largest vaccine producer in the, in the world, literally supplying 60% of the entire vaccine requirements of the, at a global level. Notwithstanding this, the COVID-19 era has dictated countries to relook at their foreign policies. And uh, I cannot see any other person more qualified than Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan to like, take a critical look at Indian foreign policy in the COVID-19 era and give his valued commentary. And uh, I once again, thank you, sir, for accepting the invitation to be delivering this lecture. And I'm sure the audience are waiting to hear you, what you have to say on the Indian foreign policy in the COVID-19 era. Thank you very much, sir. I look forward to your 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 lecture. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for these insightful remarks, and you have actually given a good overview for the uh, for the lecture itself. And uh, Ambassador T P Srinivasan now will be delivering the online uh, distinguished lecture on Indian foreign policy in the COVID nineteen era. Uh, sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dhanushree. Uh, General uh, Venkatesh, Professor. Professor Nandakishore, and uh, all the distinguished uh, participants. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Manipal. Whatever association I have had with Manipal University, I have enjoyed before. And uh, I went to Manipal when I was in charge of higher education in Kerala. And when I came back, I kept asking the question, why are we all talking about foreign universities? Why don't we just go a few kilometers to Manipal and see what a good university should be? It was an eye opener for me. So it's always a good association to be with Manipal University. And thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give this lecture. Of course, it is a very complex and very um, uh, important discussion, but this discussion started within a few months of the pandemic emerging, say early 2020. I remember hardly a month after we heard about the real seriousness of the pandemic, questions were being asked, people were asking me or many, or many others, what would be the post COVID world like would be like? And everybody was making all comments. And I told one of the journalists, 
that it is a bit too early to talk about a post-COVID world. And then he loved saying, oh, you're talking like Mao Zedong who said, you know, it is too early to make a judgment on the French Revolution. <laughs> I said, no, at least the French Revolution is over. But COVID era is not over. And nobody knows where exactly this is going to land us. So that's why I thought your formulation this time is very innovative. You did not ask me to speak about the post-COVID world. You asked me to speak about the COVID world itself in the COVID-19 era. So it is more definitive because we do not know where we end with this COVID, with all these uncertainties about the, about the disease and uncertainties about the vaccine and the various attitudes towards it. Donald Trump has left, but Trumpism remains in the United States. So it's very, very complex. And so we have to look at the situation as it emerged. But of course, before, so because the problem would be that um, at the end of the COVID, whenever it is, there could be three different set of problems. One, of course, is the health problem as such. That means sheer survival. So what has happened today is that all of us had so many ambitions for success. But today, the most important ambition should be to survive. Because if you do not survive, whatever changes take place or whatever changes you are the, uh, come up, coming about in the world will not be of any value to you, any use, new news to you. So health is the most important aspect of this, how to survive. And uh, of course, there is no single way or there is no direct way or there is no definite way of surviving it. But it is basically luck together with certain other situations that all of us are alive today. So that is really the test of this generation because we are all, most of us uh, were born after the Second World War. So we haven't seen, we haven't been in the center of a crisis before. We hear about crises, read about them, speak about them, but nowhere have we been in the center of a situation which is an ex existential threat to all of us. Then the question of demography. Is some kind of a natural selection process taking place? Are the, is the demography going to be very different? Race-wise, age-wise, uh, geographically, um, then developmentally, is there going to be a big change in the demographic structure of the world itself? Many people have not talked about it, but that's also something which we have to you know, the survival of the fittest <coughs> and who are all going to remain. Then the economy, of course, devastating effect on every economy. There is no economy in the world which has not been affected by COVID. And then the biggest in terms of people like us who are observing diplomacy and world politics, the geopolitics situation. So all these have raised many questions and we are only muddling through. Since nobody knows the contours of these changes, how are we going to make changes ourselves? And therefore we are guessing, we are inventing, we are innovating, doing various things and really speaking muddling along. So the question arises for us in 2020 for India, for example, what exactly is going to be India's foreign policy? Uh, till 2020, we had a fairly consistent, a dynamic, predictable, resilient, peace-loving foreign policy. There has not been any question about it. Nobody has challenged any of this. It was consistent, but it was not stagnant. So we have gone through several, several phases of India's foreign policy. And um, it is not, it is consistent, but it was not same. It had to change. No foreign policy can be ever, can ever be stagnant because you have a consumer. The world is a consumer of your foreign policy. And so you have to cater to the market. You cannot go on saying that I will only do this while the world changes. So the fundamental position of what India's foreign policy, which Pandit Nehru spelt out, in the middle of the night on 14th August, he said our dreams are we are going to work for, but these dreams will also be of the dreams of the world. That was the 
basic tenet of India's foreign policy. Non-alignment, etc., they all developed later. But this was his basic approach, that we are not going to live in an isolated uh, world of poverty or prosperity, but we will work with the world. And that is what earned us a huge name in the initial stages of our existence as an independence nation and also of the United Nations, when we championed decolonization, disarmament, equitable just fair distribution of wealth, human rights, etc. We never asked for anything for ourselves. But all these had impact on us, and therefore our global view was one of doing things for the world together rather than isolating ourselves. And that has continued to up to Narendra Modi, his speech at the UN this time. He almost um, repeated word by word what Pandit Nehru said in 1947 by saying that I work for 1.3 billion people of this world, but whatever I do for my 1.3 billion, I am very conscious of the rest of the world and we never do anything which is selfish or we are not seeking anything from the world, but we actually want to contribute. So that, that is the logic of our um, foreign policy, but foreign policy could be divided and not going into the details into service, maybe some periods, say about five phases. Um, first was what's called the ideological period, 1947 to 1962, when we looked at the world with some kind of rosy glasses and we thought everything will go according to our ideology and our desires. China will be part, a partner, Asia will develop and uh, provide a, an alternative to the Western world. But then in 1962, we know all that happened. After Chinese aggression, we realized that this was not going to go on. And then we shifted on to a pragmatic period, I would say, from 1963 to 1990, uh, when Mrs. Gandhi dominated the foreign policy scene, close relations with the Soviet Union because it was dictated by political and economic considerations. And there was no other country which was willing to give us what we wanted in terms of uh, technology, in terms of industry, almost everything, um, military uh, support, and uh, without having to pay in dollars. And this was something that that rupee payment arrangement that we have as a great blessing. And so we were very comfortable with uh, uh, that period. Then suddenly in 1990, the whole uh, system collapsed and Soviet Union disappeared, and we were pushed into the water to swim in a globalized and uh, liberalized economy. Mr. Narasimha Rao did very well, and he adjusted himself in India to a new situation uh, of um, with normal relations with the uh, uh, United States and um, more uh, cordial relations with most of the countries. Uh, decolonization was completed, so there was no great issues of principle to fight against uh, the United States. And the only uh, problem that remained uh, was the nuclear issue, which was also uh, sorted out. So that globalized period continued uh, till 2014, uh, until the end of uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh's uh, uh, government. And then after Mr. Modi came, we now we seem to have had something called an assertive period because Mr. Modi believed in walking into the ocean rather than standing on the on the shore and watching the ocean rather than go into it, as he as he said. And uh, so it, we became more assertive, more demanding in certain ways. We became more transactional. Uh, because he felt that uh, there could be win-win situation among countries. And therefore, we had a more assertive period from 2014 to 2020. And his first five years was, of course, uh, very, very, very successful. He was one prime minister who spelt out what India's interests are very clearly. That is security, development, neighborhood, and overseas Indians. Very clearly spelt out. And he pursued those interests very vigorously. And he had tremendous success initially till about 2016. 
um, uh, in the sense that uh, you know uh, a lot of lot of goodwill for him, and his uh, personality was very attractive, and he had unprecedented support from the people of India. You know, almost like a Time magazine cover kind of personality that he was. And uh, he was very clear about our relationship with the US, though US had refused him visa for five years. I was in I was in Washington when he came there once in 1999, but after that he was never given a visa by the United States. So he disregarded it and went straight into a good relationship with the United States because he said all these four tenets or principles or objectives of the of India, United States is the most important country, whether it is security, whether it is development, whether it is neighborhood, whether it is overseas Indians on everything that had an importance for. Uh, uh, for India and the US, and so we reached a kind of a pinnacle in 2016. When um, Mr. Modi was there in the fifth visit and he addressed the uh, US Congress. When he said there is a new symphony, the orchestra is old, but the symphony is new and we are all ready to start playing a new music in Indo-US relations. But it didn't last very long because soon after there was election and of course in between there were several parts of the accomplishment of his relationship with Obama 2015, the Indo-Pacific, we had an understanding, etc. So things were moving very well. And um, then came the Trump administration, which threw everything into some kind of a confusion. And uh, we ourselves were not very sure what was going to happen and uh, what kind of relationship will have the United States. Of course, there was nothing that uh, uh, Trump would question as far as India US elections were concerned, except for his, his um, being his bonnet about trade because he thought India was making a lot of dollars out of the United States. Very wrong impression he had. And then India should buy some more defense material from him. So I think Mr. Modi set about taming Trump as it were, you know, making use of him rather than screaming at him saying that he's um, unpredictable and is not is going crazy like many others. Well, but that's not what he did. So he managed to uh, build a relationship with him. In the process, of course, uh, Trump acted in a strange manner, you know, sometimes threatening him, sometimes embracing him all the way. But eventually he worked out a good relationship with uh, uh, Donald Trump, as good it could be. Of course, he, he was closer to Mr. Uh, Modi than many of his uh, declared allies. Uh, because he was more comfortable uh, with India. And uh, I can say he did not do anything uh, against India, though people complain about immigration, for example, that was a major problem for India. Uh, but otherwise, we had a fairly good relationship with uh, Donald Trump. And it is then that 2010-20 dawned. 2020 dawned on a wrong note, note you know the assassination of the Iranian general. That was a big event and it could have been a world war. And it was basically it was the Iranians who uh, controlled themselves not to provoke anything, thinking that they knew that uh, Trump was a different kind of American president. And we have saved that and we are just uh, sighing a, giving a sigh of relief when this pandemic came about. And so now I think this period from 2021 April or so, uh, we should start calling it maybe for lack of any other name, global restructuring period. Because everything that we held unchangeable, everything, the architecture, the global architecture that we thought would remain for some time with minor changes, collapsed virtually in front of our very eyes. And the uh, first thing that collapsed was the the global order which the Americans themselves had set up. That is the United Nations and multilateral diplomacy. Of course, Mr. Trump was not particularly fond of uh, multilateral diplomacy. He, he thought UN was a waste of time. And um, so he had already started that trend. 
and that trend became very acute with the arrival of, um, of the pandemic. And basically, the reason for that was the Chinese involvement or responsibility that people suspected. And uh, India, China was very much on the defensive when this broke out because the Americans kept calling them the Wuhan virus or China virus and various other things. And therefore, he did not, China blocked the United Nations from doing anything, even holding a meeting. The Security Council, you know, which deals with the international threat to international peace and security, there is no greater threat to international peace and security than this pandemic. And in the previous occasions like HIV, AIDS or Ebola or SARS, Security Council handled it and international cooperation was brought about. But because of uh, China's uh, role in this whole process, that was um, uh, not possible and um, everyone was left to himself. And that is the that was the first um, consequence of the of the pandemic. And this was most visible in European Union. You know, Italy was in deep trouble, France was in deep trouble. Um, but uh, UK was, but where was European Union? We can understand that uh, EU was in, not in a good shape. Brexit had not yet uh, happened. Never now it has not happened. And in that chaos, the major disaster which struck in the in Europe, I think, was basically because of lack of coherent uh, multilateral policy. In fact, the only country. Uh, which uh, asked for a multilateral approach was India. Uh, we had uh, virtually given up SARC because of our problems with Pakistan, but we were willing to even forget that and call a meeting of SARC. That was the first multilateral meeting which was called. And Pakistan did not send its prime minister. They sent somebody who came and spoke only about Kashmir and not about uh, COVID. And so that attempt did not work, but at the same time, we made a big contribution and others did. And some amount of work has been done in terms of, uh, um, you know, working, working together. And uh, then the G20, again at our, our instance, that uh, uh, G20 was uh, summoned by uh, Saudi Arabia. Then of course G7 took place and all that, some activity. But the UN completely failed humanity. Whatever credibility that the UN had was lost and it was a dereliction of duty. And it goes back to the same old problems of the UN, the dominance of P5, lack of reform for which we have been trying for more than 40 years. So anyway, the UN became completely uh, useless in this process. And on top of it, WHO was in disgrace. And all this uh, became very serious. But uh, looking back at the last one year, I think India promoted, not only promoted a lot of activity, but also did a lot of work, as the general just mentioned. Uh, you know, even when we did not have enough of these things, uh, medicines or uh, equipment or relief materials, we gave whatever we had. We shared with the world. And that was a major, major action that we took in our foreign policy. And that has uh, done us good because the developing countries, people were helpless, started looking up to India. And even now with the vaccines, even though the picture is not very clear, but the sense of internationalism and internationalization, uh, we have been working. The details are not very clear whether we are dealing with this vaccine or that vaccine. But at least assurance has been given that together with our own uh, resources and our own technology, uh, we'll be uh, doing some good to the world. And that has been a part of our foreign policy uh, methodology and objective and activity, which should be noted in our foreign policy posture during the COVID-19 era. But surprise of surprises was, of course, the Chinese uh, movement on the full on the on the border, and uh, they are occupying uh, positions in uh, on the line of actual control in uh, defiance of all the agreements that we have reached with China, starting with uh, 
Mr. Vajpayee's visit in 1979, Rajiv Gandhi's visit in 1986, and then Narasimha Rao in 1993. A large number of agreements were reached, basically to keep the border tranquil and peaceful. I remember when my own uh, boyhood, we used to scream and shout that we will not even speak to the Chinese unless we get Aksai Chin back and things like that. But we virtually surrendered everything by saying that let there be peace on the border. We neither side shall change the situation by use of force. And that 1993 agreement was what kept the peace in on the border, on the line of actual control, but of course, comparative peace. It was not a complete peace. There were several instances. Uh, there was even um, uh, some casualties in uh, uh, some during that period. Uh, but also, but for 45 years, there was no casualty on the on the border. Even after 2017, when we had the Dokalam crisis. And um, even though that is not ended yet, but there was some kind of a settlement of Dokolam. And then comes now Galwan and Ladakh and various other. Of course, we don't know what the reason for it was, because the two, two, two or three reasons that uh, are obvious. One, China's uh, sense of guilt, and uh, they thought that they would be condemned and criticized by the whole world. And therefore wanted to they flex their muscles a little bit to show that China is a strong country and so on. Uh, plus, inevitably, the feeling that the Americans were withdrawing from the global scene and a vacuum is being created and therefore China has to somehow step in there. And for that, you need to have a global perspective and, uh, and, and the importance has to be asserted. So, and um, the, this could be then, of course, the other other guess is that there is a collusion between Pakistan and China uh, with respect to Article 370. Uh, then uh, CAA, then uh, division of uh, Jammu and Kashmir into two union, ter union territories, which changed the nature of Ladakh in which China has a uh, great uh, interest and therefore uh, we uh, could understand this was a mix of all but india decided to have a three pronged approach to the china question one is of course ne the negotiations and dialogue which will be started the next day and a number of agreements were reached including the agreement reached between the foreign ministers in moscow but no disengagement took place and it was actually after the first disengagement, disengagement was announced that the tragedy occurred of uh, Indian soldiers being killed brutally by the Chinese. We also seem to have killed some Chinese, but they don't uh, they don't admit that. But whatever it is, this uh, changed the India-China relations dynamics completely different. Now the, all the agreements were virtually buried, even though they still talk about them. And there is need for a readjustment. But we said negotiations first. Then the second prong was the strengthening of our defense forces, defense capability. You know, we got the new aircraft, and trying to get S-400 missiles, and generally speeded up purchases and speeded up uh, reform of the, not, not really a reform, but also placement of the army and uh, are, and arming them, preparing them for, if possible, for a confrontation. Knowing very well there is no balance between India and China in this respect. A war is not going to help us in any manner. So, but at the same time, we had to be ready not to avoid a crisis like the 1962. So we did what we could and we continue to do that in terms of um, the roads and bridges and various infrastructure plus military equipment and full preparedness. And as part of it, we also improved our relationship with countries. Um, and uh, readily, we had uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Pompey opening their arms to us, uh, which of course even Obama had wanted, in a sense, in the Indian Ocean, in India-Pacific, greater cooperation between 
India and the United States and the talk of the Quad had come about even before. But we were kind of shy, you know, uh, uh, participant in this, reluctant participant, because we are the only ones who has a land border with China. All these others do not have a land border with China. So we had to be doubly careful. And therefore, while we accepted the notion of cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, we did not promote any structural changes or new structures of an alliance. But then we came to very much to that after this Chinese action. So in a sense, China pushed us into a tight embrace with the United States. And um, we reluctantly had to accept that uh, because without that, there would be no support base for us. Not that we expect the Americans to fight our battle or anything of that kind, uh, but to have the only superpower on your side is helpful in uh, many ways. And this was the period when the United States itself was getting fed up of China's expansionist intentions and their uh, dominating uh, projects like BRI and others. So they have provoked the Americans also equally, and therefore we found a common cause. And uh, my best friend in the American politics is uh, Pompeo because he spoke the best language ever about India and United States and against China. He would not even refer to China as China. He would refer to it as Chinese Communist Party. And he would call Xi Jinping the chairman of the Communist Party of China. He never called him the president of China. So he was de-recognizing. And when he was asked why was he doing that, he said, why should I blame the poor citizens of China with whom we have good relationship? But it is the party and the PLA which are giving all this trouble. So they are the ones to be treated. And so his prescription was simply uh, revival or establishing a kind of alliance with, uh, uh, with the Quad. And India also moved quite a bit on this because these fundamental agreements that India was supposed to sign with China, five of them, we had signed four, but the fifth we had held back because it had certain element of supervision or cooperation, you know, operationalizing, uh, joint operations, some kind of, um, uh, with certain amount of routineness about it. And that is why I think we had held back that, but um, we came to, Pompeo came to India and uh, we signed that, which made us even beyond 2016 level of relationship. 2016, we had not signed these agreements, even though we called ourselves a major defense partner of United States. So in a sense, the whole structure for a major defense partner, which means we are entitled to technology, and equipment, which are available only to allies like the NATO allies. And therefore we have the background set, but we did not take the final plunge because by then, of course, things were changing, elections took place and uh, Trump lost the elections, uh, at least we hope, unless he comes out with some kind of uh, magic. Uh, he, on his way out, and uh, then we have a new situation where you cannot expect the same kind of uh, reaction to China from Biden uh, because Democrats have generally been more, shall we say, uh, cooperative with China. I was in Washington during the democratic days. Uh, whenever we talked about China, we always found certain hope in the democratic Democrats uh, that uh, China will himself, himself turn democratic, but the, the Republicans never believed that. So even during the uh, Clinton regime, when we had to really get support from the United States, it was the Republicans who supported us. Kissinger was the first one to say India lives in a uh, tough neighborhood, justifying India's uh, nuclear capability. So so we, we want to know where it will be as far as so our own relations with China, as I said, is completely destroyed or disturbed and we need to realign ourselves with China and that time has not yet come. So then we have to look at the globe. What are the trends which are coming up? And here, of course, the major factor will be uh, US-China relations. So much is being said and written about it. They also agree that China would be their main rival if not an adversary, 
in our case they are an adversary or like George Fernandez said we could say even number one enemy uh, but the Americans don't do that and, uh, and they have so much common interest between them at the moment and as uh, the biggest uh, economy and second biggest economy they have a G2 approach that both of them together have to do things and therefore there will be no adversity between US and China and um, US may not be as supportive of uh, India as we would want to be. In other words, they will they'll be more cautious and just as we are. And therefore we have to watch uh, how this, uh, this dynamics of US China develop in all categories in, um, uh, in trade. Trade of course they had almost a trade war but um, but uh, Mr. Biden has developed what is called a middle class foreign policy, which is a foreign policy which enabled the middle class of the United States to export their products to foreign countries. So he said he will not sign any new trade agreements, but we will want a middle class uh, foreign policy, a new thing which is yet to yet to develop. So we have to be we have to be watchful on this. So on the one hand, while preparing ourselves for a new relationship with China, the base of which we don't know, and there are rumors about changes inside China. But um, but Mr. Modi should know Xi Jinping after meeting him 18 times and visiting China five times and spending hours together in Mamallapuram, eating idlis and all that. So they should be knowing each other a little bit. And that's probably is the reason why Mr. Modi is not panicking about it. He is, uh, people wonder why he's not saying anything, but he's allowing the process to continue. I think with the expectation that the Xi Jinping that he knows uh, may not be as destructive as he appears to be today, and he may have internal compulsions. Um, but the fourth, the third prong in our dealing with China is the economic sanctions. And that we did, we withdrew certain things, imposed some restrictions. But the more of these restrictions we imposed, uh, we realized how dependent we are on China and how difficult it is going to be to decouple China from the Indian economy. So that process is going on. China is showing some irritation, but they are not giving us any, any ultimatum on that score because they also know that this huge trade deficit that we have with China has to be filled by more exports, more collaboration, more investment, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we hold that there. Then the third element, so one is our bilateral relationship with China, then the China-US relationship where we have to find an equation. And the third is globalization. We were great champions of globalization just as uh, United States was. And inside India, there was a lot of debate as to globalization was not good for us or not. But we said whether it is good for us or not, it is here and we cannot escape it. That was the position that we had taken. Even the chief minister of, uh, uh, of West Bengal once said that, you know, uh, the, I mean, the communist chief minister of West Bengal. Uh, Jyoti Basu said that globalization is inevitable and we would rather adjust ourselves to it rather than try to defeat it. But some noise about against globalization started coming up with Donald Trump. And uh, he is not a great champion, just as he's not a great champion of multilateralism. He's also not a great champion of globalization. And so he distanced himself from much of uh, the globalized uh, initiatives. Of course, he walked out of various uh, international commitments, starting with TPP and then to, um, the Inar Iranian nuclear deal and the Paris Agreement, Cuba understanding. So all these we walked out of, saying that this is all I'm going to do it all myself. And uh, as we moved on, uh, we also discovered some some problems about uh, globalization. And that is reflected in uh, our absence from APEC. When APEC was set up, India should have been a natural partner. 
a natural uh, member of the Asia Pacific. But we were kept out of it. We demanded it for several years and then we gave up. So there was no way that they would accommodate India in that. Then came the BRI for which we were invited to participate and we found it was not very safe to join there because their interests were dominating the world. And so we kept out of it. And then finally, we also had to keep out of our CEP, the biggest uh, trade agreement involving all our trading partners, ASEAN in a big way, and other Southeast Asian countries and China. So it was logical that we should be in it and we expected understanding from all these countries to uh, protect India's interests, but the point came. In fact, the Prime Minister had gone there to sign the agreement, but he had to come back without signing the agreement. So we had another issue of uh, keeping out of what is called the, the consensus understanding of the countries of the region. So since then, I think our policymakers, uh, Foreign Minister has been making some some remarks like uh, globalization has resulted in deindustrialization of India. And then the Prime Minister started talking about Atmanar Bharata, which the general mentioned. Well, these are all very, very good concepts, but um, the problem is how the world sees you in all this. And how do people of India themselves see these, uh, these moves? The idea of boycotts, walkouts, it's not something that India has been doing very much. Of course, the Indian charge of affairs walk out of a banquet in, <laughs> in Beijing is very famous. Lakhan Narotra and his wife walked out of uh, a banquet for Bhutto. The whole country celebrated it. <laughs> but um, but as, a, as a diplomatic ploy, I don't think uh, we have advocated it or practiced it. But two things happened when our foreign minister was in uh, Washington. He refused to go to a, a congressional meeting where there was a Indian origin a lady congressman, congresswoman who had spoken harshly about Kashmir and he, he refused to go there. And even more recently, when um, the, on the farmer strike, when Trudeau made some very unacceptable uh, remarks, but we should have understood that he is talking because of his electoral interest. He once had five, six in his cabinet, more than Dr. Manmohan Singh had. But, um, but we took it very harshly and of course we responded to it. That's fair enough. But Mr. the minister did not even participate in a COVID meeting, which was called by uh, Canada. So these are some trends that you see that we are becoming more rigid on some of these issues. And um, no, we do not know how long we can hold these and uh, what kind of mechanisms will be available for us to um, you know get adjusted in this uh, fractured globalization that's what is happening now globalization is taking place in different uh, uh, groups uh, but not globally and uh, the word that our government has invented is that uh, multipolarity because we have always been wanting multipolarity in the world now we talk of multipolarity regionally. So that is that uh, multi alignments. You choose your alignments on the basis, basis of your interest. Like we are in uh, BRICS, uh, we are in SCEO, uh, we are in, a, in um, other regional groups where Russia and China are there in one way or the other. In some places, both are there. And, um, and so, it is possible for us to identify groupings and arrangements which are suitable to India in a, in a big way. And then we try to uh, work out the relationship of the future. And when it comes to the common good, uh, like um, the pandemic itself, when um, climate change and, um, and various other uh, global issues. Of course, globalization will continue, but where our own in, in national interests are concerned, we are slightly moving away from the 
the globalized uh, globalized world and moving to some kind of selective uh, alliances. Uh, one more country which I have to refer to is Russia. Russia is moving closer to China inevitably and they have even more recently said that India should not misunderstand if they get a bit closer to Pakistan. And these are dangerous signals from Russia and uh, we are very much dependent on Russia in very many ways. Any break in from Russia will mean major changes. So I do not think we want to do that. Uh, we would like to work out a good relationship with uh, Russia. And, um, you know, China, Americans themselves understand India's compulsions on Russia, which was um, demonstrated by the fact that they did not impose sanctions against us for importing S-400 missiles from Russia. So they know that we are dependent on Russian technology and therefore they though, though they talked about it under their new law, if they have sanctions against some country, then others should also not deal with that country, Kasta or whatever. So that is something which they have implemented in the case of Turkey. Turkey is also wanting to offer S-400 missiles from Russia, but uh, US has imposed a ban on that while they have not done it on India. So that means even within your allies, there could be differences on military aspects sometimes. But the Americans explained it that with India having S-400, America has nothing to do with it. It is an Indian capability. But when Turkey buys that, what happens is they have joint operability as NATO countries. And then there'll be a problem if you use Russian equipment in the middle of all the NATO equipment. And that's probably the reason. And that is an understandable reason too. So uh, that is there. And therefore our relationship with Russia, we have to maintain uh, we, if they go all the way to China, all the way trying to solve our, solve our problems with China by merely advocating us to be um, giving concessions to China, then that will be another challenge uh, we will have. So this is the general picture and uh, these are all still in the thinking stage. Much of what I told you, you may not find it in print return that this is our policy, etc., etc. These are all from indications, what I call the straws in the wind in South Block. And these are to be found in speeches, in some response, uh, some actions. So this is the kind of picture that we are, which is emerging in the case of uh, India's foreign policy in the COVID world. First of all, basically to deal with COVID itself, deal with globalization, deal with China, deal with India, Ch China, US relations, dealing with Russia, dealing with uh, all the developing world, whether we will be able to put together the developing world against China. In fact, today I think Shyam Saran has an article in the Indian Express where suggesting that we must use some of the techniques that we used during the Cold War. So in other words, he is asking for a resurrection of the non-aligned techniques. But this is something which many people will uh, not accept because they want they think that non-alignment was was a mistake and it has not done us any good and whether these smaller countries will gang up with us against china is not very clear and so to that extent people are exercising their mind and uh, making suggestions but all this will depend on two things basically one is covid itself how long it is going to go and secondly american protocols so once these things clear, then we will also be able to move in the direction that we have set for ourselves and hopefully find a place in the new world, which you always have envisaged as a multipolar world. Now we want a multipolar world with multipolar regional organizations. And that is our ambition. Our ambition is not to conquer the world or dominate the world. But we have this whole issue of Poverty, the whole issue of supply chains, the whole issue of trade. All these will become lubricated only when the foreign policy is set. And um, so we are in that process. In between, we have the farmers strike and we have other problems inside the country. And um, so we must solve all that by the time these other two situations are solving themselves. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Overview of so many different issues that you raised uh, uh, the trends in India's foreign policy, India's conceptualization of its own national interests, and also trends in globalization uh, and what's happening now with the COVID 19. Of course, uh, uh, a lot of things have changed in the past one year. And uh, thank you so much for giving such a great uh, overview of uh, various kinds of issues, like I said, like including bilateral relationships with different countries, including China, the US, Russia and also talking about India's approach towards multilateral institutions like uh, um, and regional dynamics, uh, the UN, for instance, also G20. So many, uh, so many different issues you have brought up in the lecture, which has been very enriching, including the historical background impact uh, to India's foreign policy, dividing it into various phases. Um, and which is, of course, something that we also look at uh, in some of the courses in the Department of Geopolitics. So I'm sure most of the students also uh, must uh, have found it extremely enriching. Uh, thank you once again. Now I would like to uh, open the floor for questions. Um, so we have, like I said, there are a few students who are offline and they will be asking questions from the classroom uh, here and others, of course, can raise their hands and ask your questions. Um, and another option is that you can also, if your mic is not working or anything is wrong, then of course you can type your question in the comments section and I can read it out. So please raise your hands if there are any questions. Uh, Anand, are you, uh, are you there in the classroom? I'm, I'm here. Uday, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. So uh, the, we have two questions here. I'll ask Rahul. To sure. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, it was actually enlightening to know about different perspectives through which we view multilateralism and multipolarity from India's perspective as well. Uh, I had a question regarding um, the RCEP approach that you talked about. So just based on the limited knowledge or uh, perspectives that I've had on RCEP, I think India's disengagement with this um, you know, agreement was kind of justified in a way that uh, there were statements from the MEA as well that we need optimal engagement towards globalization and not just a full fledged engagement without any considerations of Indian interests. So I, I think maybe disengaging from RCEP served two purposes. Uh, one was showing that India uh, wants to have you know a parity in powers in the RCEP where the greater powers do not dominate the multilateral institutions and the second one would probably be that India is successful in showing itself as a pole in itself where it can say that I have agreements with all the RCEP member states anyway, but uh, I choose to remain out of this as it does not serve my interest to be in the RCEP. So uh, I just wanted to know in what perspective um, did you mean about you know, our RCEP engagement and if you could provide me with your ideas on it as well. Sir. Thank you. I was only pointing it out. I never said it is good or bad. Did you? Did I? I didn't say that. What I was saying was that situations land you in situations like this, the policies that sometimes you have to keep up. And unfortunately, we are keeping out of too many things. And that will be misunderstood as a trend in India's foreign policy. That's all that I said. I know very well the reasons why we are not in our city. The main thing is we don't want zero tariff. We cannot operate on that basis. And we have so many agreements with ASEAN and other countries. And China is coming into that and exploiting that situation. You know? So they, they, they will really unnecessarily. So I can understand that. But the problem is that keeping out of things rather than being in, it's unfortunate, but it is happening. And uh, so these are also some of the challenges. That's all that I mean. So RCB, we have a good reason to be out of it. And not only there is not a closed chapter, they have kept us as an observer and they have kept the window open and so on. But the real villain of the piece is China. And therefore, we needed to have that leverage which we exercised. So, so I'm not blaming 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, there's a question by a colleague of mine, Mayank Chari. I'll ask him to ask him a question. Thank you, sir. Very good evening, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Sir. It was genuinely very illuminating. Uh, I had a question that was uh, slightly different from the talk you gave, but of course related to foreign policy. Uh, we had news in April that uh, India had become the third largest defense vendor right after the United States and China. Um, in the context of the subsequent lockdowns and a lot of the economic pressures that have built on India as a consequence of the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, sir, do you think that the trend in military expenditure will continue? And if it won't, then what are the strategies that the government of India can adopt to better securitize our interests? Thank you so much, sir. Well, I didn't go to that aspect, uh, but we cannot really reduce our military expenditure. I remember arguing with the, with, the, with the Americans when I was there. I said, what is the per capita expenditure of an Indian on defense? It's only 10 rupees. So we can afford that. <laughs> so even if you go to 100 rupees, we will be able to afford that. Then the Americans are looking at us may also as it's saying uh, horrible things. But uh, that is inevitable. We have to increase it because we have a, a tough neighborhood and uh, both China and Pakistan. And therefore, that trend will continue. I do not think that we'll be able to make uh, big uh, changes. But Mr. Modi had very good plans. This whole idea of make in India was to take away at least this reputation that we have as the biggest. Not only we are third biggest spender, we are also biggest importer of arms. So, so he was saying if you make it here, at least people will not count the arms that we are buying from outside. So make in India was that. But then Americans did not buy that at all. Initially, they made many projects, but when it came to technology and our not having this fifth agreement with them on defense uh, cooperation, they were not willing to go further than that. And then the, then Trump also changed his policy. You know, his, he, he didn't send people to uh, Bangalore uh, to do their work. And uh, therefore, that the idea of this uh, Make in India has uh, virtually disappeared. There may be some projects somewhere or the other, but so this trend will continue. I don't think we have any option to do that. Thank you. Are there any other questions, Mayank, from the classroom? Uh, no, ma'am. OK, uh, all right. Are there any online questions? Anybody from who's attending the session online? OK, I don't see anyone's hands up, so. Um, no, right now there are no more questions here, uh, but I, I I would just like to ask one question if that's OK. Um, I actually wanted to know your uh, views because since you mentioned a lot about multipolarity and also multilateralism and especially with the Trump administration, you know, that did not quite well uh, work quite well. Uh, how do you see India's position here after with the Biden administration coming in? Um, uh, and then, you know, a lot of issues that usually work under this whole uh, global governance agenda, like including climate change and everything. Um, how how do you think India is going to approach these issues now onwards? Because a lot of these issues had, you know, gone to the back burner for a for for you know, during the Trump administration, which may actually come to the come to the front now. Uh, so, if you can probably give some uh, views on, you know, what can we expect in 2021? Okay, certainly something of America. I talked up, I, I touched on that, but not it did not go into great detail. There's one question everybody asks now that you have Biden, you have Kamala Harris, so you are going to have a celebration, you know. So uh, on the other hand, people know what Kamala Harris has said about Kashmir and what Biden has said about China. So so there's a mix of all this, lot of. But I start with the premise that. Mr. Biden knew India as the vice president of Obama for eight years. So we know where this man is coming from. So he cannot come from the wilderness. He's not a Trump. So he knows exactly what US interests are in uh, India. And he also knows China. And he has also worked with vice with uh, President Obama who had a very good relationship with India. So I presume that he will be generally sympathetic and sensitive to India's needs, but of course, primacy to his own interest. Even Kamala Harris cannot be expected 
to do something for India without thinking about her own country. You know, she she calls herself a black American. She never says I'm a I'm an Indian origin person. She talks about her mother and so on, but politically she doesn't call herself an a, a South Asian or an Indian. And she kind of can't call her even African because her uh, father was uh, from uh, Jamaica, not from Africa. So he's only black. So black woman, black politician is her her um, affiliation, and uh, therefore she'll be particularly careful. But Indians have a love for her. We paid her a lot of money and promoted people moved from Trump to Biden because of her and so on. So we have a friendly, as friendly it can be, an administration. So we can expect them to understand our concerns. But their concerns will take prior priority. Like for example, I, I, you know, Trump is not the one, only one who calls um, the Paris Agreement a hoax. I also call it a hoax. I don't know if you saw my article in the Hindu where I said, Pan, you know, this is not a panacea because we did not want this agreement because what we want is the Kyoto Protocol. You remember that? That is where the developed countries have their obligations, come mandatory cuts, while we have the ability to increase our greenhouse gas emissions. That was the approach. Until I, I proudly say, when I, as long as I was the chief negotiator, we did not give it up because I am up to, up to Kyoto Protocol. Then I left and uh, heavens fell in the sense that then the Chinese and the Americans got together. Because the Americans started saying that we will not do anything on climate change unless China, India and Brazil do something. Because you are the biggest polluters. We negotiated out of that way by saying this is per capita emission is more important. So somehow it went through in Rio de Janeiro. It went through up to Kyoto. But then it came to a complete standstill. And unknown to us, China and the United States got together and cooked up this Paris Agreement, which is voluntary emission control by everybody. Right? And, um, and that is the one that five countries got together, including us in Copenhagen, and left out the entire developing world outside in the dark. They did not know what we were cooking up. And they walked out of the conference. Copenhagen was a great disaster. And so that is the one which has eventually become the Paris Agreement. That's everybody voluntarily saying we'll reduce so much. And then you add it up to make sure that the temperature doesn't go beyond one and a half degrees Celsius. Then what happened? All these were com compiled by the UN and made a calculation and then they found that it is three degrees Celsius, even if they implement all their commitments. And then what? So the water will be up to this, this is 1.5 below the nose. But 1.75 is already above the nose. So then what is the point with three degrees Celsius? <laughs> You're already gone. The world has disappeared. So it is a hoax. Paris Agreement is a deception on the, on the men. So, but Biden has said, I'm going to go by Paris Agreement, certainly. And then he said, 2050, I'll make a United States carbon free. Do we have the technology to do that? What do we do with all our, um, uh, our coal and fuel? And our nuclear things which we wanted to promote, it is still three and a half percent in our nuclear power because of all that happened, which was supposed to go at least up to seven percent after the nuclear deal. It did not happen. So where are we going to go? So if this gentleman says he declares 2050 and asks everybody else to join in, so that was the last sentence of my article. That will put United States and India on the opposite sides of the table. Then how do you deal with them is up to you. Similarly on China, on China, he will want to do business with China. He will not want uh, G 5G to be um, extracted out of China or not cooperate with them. Because technology is extremely important for the, for the United States. And the United States is not used to do, doing their hands. They do R&D and hand it over to the Chinese and the Indians and the Japanese and so on. And they don't manufacture anything. In fact, their dream was not to manufacture anything in China. In, sorry, in the United States. They make their drawings, get 80% of the profit, and happily stay home. And uh, so that is their dream of industrialization. And we, we cannot afford that. And so there again, we, so there will be points of difference with the United States. And that is why the China factor and uh, the usefulness of the of India 
in a possible confrontation between China and the United States is our best bet. And that is what the Republicans used to say. If we have to have a quarrel with the Chinese, the only country in that part of the world, a democracy, which will start stand by the United States is China. They cannot trust ASEAN, they cannot trust Australia. So that is the uh, rationale. So there are so many imponderables, whatever rest you may plan, you know, like the whole world planned thinking that 21st century belongs to the Soviet Union. You know, that was what Ambassador Gujral, he was my ambassador in uh, Moscow, used to send these telegrams to Delhi, middle of the night to Mr. Chavan, saying that 20, 21st century belongs to the Soviet Union. So one day Mr. Chavan sent back a reply. My God, 21st century is a bit far away, Ambassador, please keep quiet, let me sleep. <laughs> because he was getting these telegrams in the middle of the night. <laughs> so... But where is Soviet Union? Where is 21st century? So you cannot, in foreign policy, you cannot plan these things. And I'm sure Mr. Modi had the beautiful plans about good relations with China and settling of the border question. So there are many things which are not in our hands. So the usual, the, the usual cliche, hope for the best and be prepared for the worst. <laughs> That's all that you can do. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um... If there are no more questions, um, I would I would like to conclude this program with a vote of thanks. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan, uh, thank you so much for joining us this uh, afternoon and uh, delivering a wonderful lecture to our students, also to the external participants and also to the faculty and others at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Uh, and since you also mentioned uh, you have a long history of relationship with the uh, with Mahi itself, so I hope this uh, uh, this engagement happens and continues through various platforms, including the uh, STS4 uh, and uh, of course through uh, Professor M D Nalapat and others. So I hope uh, that we will continue to uh, hear your lectures in the future as well. Uh, I would like to. Self has turned out to be my brother's friend, so one more yes. connection. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, so secondly, I would like to thank um, uh, the Vice Chancellor, Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Lieutenant General Dr. Uh, Venkatesh, uh, who also agreed to preside over this webinar. And he's been very supportive of our ventures um, and all our uh, webinars and events and other activities that have, we have been carrying out in the past few months. And uh, I would like to once again thank him and the entire uh, administration of Mahi. For, uh, for helping us create this platform to conduct such uh, uh, online distinguished lectures. Um, and since, you know, with the COVID-19, of course, we've been able to conduct more and more such sessions with speakers like you. And probably that's one of the positives that we have uh, come up with in recent months. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, Dr. Nand Kishore, uh, head in charge, uh, Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, uh, for coordinating this event and also making this event possible for uh, all the support that he has given us in this respect. I would like to thank all my colleagues here, Dr. Anand, Dr. Monish, and Dr. Ravi, um, uh, for supporting uh, this event as well. And last but not the least, of course, I would like to thank the students um, and other participants who have gathered here and also who have joined online and um, participating in this webinar actively. And uh, so that's about it. I would like to say that this particular webinar is recorded. So this will be uploaded on our YouTube channel, the department's YouTube channel. So if someone could not attend the event, could not attend the webinar, they will have a choice of watching it online later on as well. So that's about it. I would. Uh, say thank you once again to all of you and I hope to see you again maybe in the future and some of the future events that we would be organizing. Thank you once again, uh, sir. Thank, thank you, Ambassador, sir. sir. Wonderful meeting you, sir. Wonderful meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you to our Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, for gracing this occasion, sir. Pleasure, thank sir. You. Thank you. Vice.